welcome everyone. We're just gonna um, give a minute to let folks file into the Zoom room. So we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us for Stanier Gallery's first virtual artist talk, which is being presented in conjunction with the current exhibition in the gallery, The Gorilla Girls, The Art of Behaving Badly. My name is Clover Archer. I'm the director of Stanier Gallery here in the Department of Art and Art History at WNL University. Our physical gallery exhibition is open to the WNL community. And if you're not on campus, there is a link on our webpage that will bring you to a virtual gallery tour. If you joined us tonight using the Zoom webinar link, you will be able to submit questions at the end of the lecture using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, depending on time, I'm not sure how many questions we'll be able to get to, so I apologize in, a, in advance if we don't get to them all. And also please note that this event is being recorded. Before I introduce our artists, I want to express my gratitude to WNL President Will Dudley and the Office of the Provost for supporting this exhibition and event, which are made possible in part thanks to the generosity of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I also want to acknowledge the Stanier Gallery student intern, Chloe Parsons, for all of her hard work and thank Jim Goodwin, Dave Pfaff, and Elisa Shires for all of their help navigating the technology needed to present the virtual exhibition and lecture. Frida Kahlo and Augusta Savage, both uh, members of the Gorilla Girls, have been hugely patient and understanding as we navigated our way to, to tonight to live streaming, so I wish to thank them as well. Tonight, I am so pleased to welcome one of the founding members of the Gorilla Girls, Frida Kahlo. The Gorilla Girls are a collective of feminist activist artists that formed in New York City in 1985 in response to an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. It was a survey of international painters and sculpt sculptors that featured 165 artists, but only 13 women. A group of female artists who were protesting the underrepresentation of women in the show became the Gorilla Girls. And since that time, they've been leading a crusade against discrimination in the art world and beyond. The members of the group are anonymous, appearing in gorilla masks and taking the names of deceased women artists to deflect attention away from the individual members and keep the focus on fighting discrimination and supporting human rights for all people and genders. The Gorilla Girls mission is more important than ever, which is why we're so privileged to have their work on campus and to have the Gorilla Girls here with us tonight. So I am going to turn it over to the main presentation, uh, the Gorilla Girls. What's very good about our image is that when you look at our masks, you think of what we stand for. And we stand for the conscience of the art world. And we feel that there, there is underrepresentation of women and minorities. 
And when you see our logo, basically, when you see our face, that's what we stand for, and it's not personal. Women artists have never gotten the serious attention and certainly not the serious money that male artists do. Why? The Gorilla Girls, who call themselves the conscience of the art world, have plastered their answer all over town. Coming into the city right now, probably 65% of the young artists are females. And yet, less than 10% have their work shown. And that's one of the reasons I'm a gorilla girl. We believe that getting into a gallery or being shown in a museum even is for an artist an employment situation. The question was, how are you going to get women artists recognized when names, lives committed to art was completely ignored by the art history books? And so some of what we did was just attention getting. do-gooders like Robin Hood, Batman, Zorro, and the Lone Ranger. Most of the women who are doing all the bitching are completely talentless. For example, the, like the top women artists, you don't hear them making these embarrassing feminist pleas. I mean, it's just that these women, are, they don't have any talent, and they're taking it out on men. Everybody who attended the Museum of Modern Art this year went up to the information desk and said, gee, where are the women artists? They put them on the walls. Okay, don't worry about your masculinity with these masks, folks. I'm going to take mine off now. Hi, everyone. I'm Frida Kahlo. I'm one of the founders of the Gorilla Girls. And I've been involved in just about everything you will see tonight. And I'm so happy to welcome you all to this, our very first Gorilla Girl virtual gig. Give it up for WNL. You know, these are really tough times all over the world. Demagogues, dictators, domestic terrorists, white nationalists are all on the rise. In the midst of a deadly pandemic, immense economic hardship, and cataclysmic climate change. The lies are endless, and the racism, inequality, police violence, hate speech, corruption, and death get worse every day. Is anyone out there as nervous as I am about the upcoming election? Should we start out tonight with one huge collective scream into our computer screens. Everyone ready? Warn your housemates. One, two, three. Ah! Ah! Whew. Didn't that feel good? Here's a poster we did in November of 2016 right after the election of Donald Trump. We were thinking about how Americans commemorate the heritage and struggle of marginalized groups during certain months of the year and how that might change under a President Trump. We've, we're sort of known for our political humor and this poster seemed ironic after the shock of the election. But four years in, it's not funny anymore because a lot of it is really happening. 
Here's a short video we made this summer to document our participation in some protests. It's not funny either. Okay, let's skip ahead to something that we can all do. This year's election. It just happens to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. In theory, the amendment gave women the right to vote, but we know now that the early suffrage movement was rife with racism. Indigenous people on whose occupied lands we stand at the moment didn't get the vote until much later. And black and brown votes continue to be suppressed. And many states still permanently take away voting rights from anyone who's been incarcerated. But this year, let's all vow to be vigilant and work in whatever way we can to make universal suffrage for all Americans a reality. And can we suggest something that you could do? Because we understand there's been a bit of controversy on your campus about the school's name. And we heard a rumor that there's a simple solution that's been proposed that could save the university a ton of money, not having to change all those building plaques, stationaries, library cards. Sounds great to us, but please remember the ladies and rename yourselves the Kerry Washington and Spike Lee University. We are sure under the circumstances that Denzel won't mind. But let's move on to our creation story. Imagine it's 1985. You're a female artist in New York. And when you look around, you see that almost all the opportunities in the art world go to white men. Imagine the Museum of Modern Art opens a survey of supposedly international art with only 13 women and eight artists of color. You go to a protest outside the museum and you realize that no one going in even cares. You wonder what would it take to break through the misconception that the art system is a meritocracy in which all the critical filters, the curators, the dealers, the critics, and especially those wealthy collectors always know what's best. Imagine right then and there, you have your aha movement moment and you decide that you must find a way to show that art history is incomplete without including all the voices that make up our large, beautiful teeming diverse culture. So you dream up a new kind of street poster, an unforgettable in your face poster meant to wake people up. You call a meeting of some equally angry friends, you choose to be anonymous, you name yourselves guerrilla girls, you decide to wear guerrilla masks and you take the names of dead women artists as pseudonyms. <clears throat> in a couple of weeks, you're sneaking around New York in the middle of the night, carrying stacks of posters and buckets of glue. These posters, hanging around art galleries ignite a public discussion about racism, sexism, and corruption in the art world. Over 60 individuals come in and out of your group. They're cis, lesbian, transgender, 
They're diverse in age, sexual orientation, economic class, and from many ethnic backgrounds, South Asian, Asian, African-American, Latinx, European, et cetera. Hundreds of posters, billboards, street banners, stickers, and books follow, not just about the lack of diversity in art, but also in film, politics, and pop culture. Then come big street pro projects in cities all over the world, like Rotterdam, Mexico City, Istanbul, Athens, Shanghai, and recently in Kochi, India, at the first international Biennale, the Kochi Biennale, with over 50% women and only a tiny minority of artists from Europe or the United States. There are exhibitions in Montreal, London, Bilbao, Madrid, Germany, Sweden, Auckland, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Argentina, Sao Paulo, Quito, Peru, Bucharest, Romania, and right here at Carrie and Spike U. Yo, New York City, what are you waiting for? The Gorilla Girls deserve an exhibition. We love doing this work and we feel so lucky to be able to do it. And we're so grateful to the thousands of people all over the world, ages eight to 88, who write and tell us that we have inspired them to do their own crazy kind of activism. Our first two posters targeted fellow artists and their galleries. Next, we went after museums, critics, and the New York Times. Whenever we put up posters, we would lurk around on the streets nearby, overhear what people had to say about them, and get ideas for the next ones. <clears throat> this is an example of how bad things were. We weren't complaining because there weren't 50% this or even 13% that. We were complaining about zero, zero, one, and zero. And it was even harder for women artists of color. So we did this very early intersectional poster. Soon the word on the street was that the Gorilla Girls were just a bunch of whining complainers. So negative. We took this complaint to heart and decided to do a poster to help artists be more positive about their situation. And here it is, the advantages of being a woman artist. They're not exactly advantages, <laughs> but all of us have our own favorite advantages from among them. And I'm kind of split between being included in revised version of art history and knowing that whatever kind of art you do, it will be labeled feminine. And of course, our group favorite is getting your picture in the art magazines wearing a gorilla suit. What's yours? This poster has been translated into many languages and hardly a week goes by that we don't get letters from people in fields as diverse as veterinary medicine, music, physics, cartooning, even mortuary science, telling us that this poster is the story of their lives too. A few years later, we were invited to do a billboard in Manhattan and we wanted to try out this crazy voice we had developed on a larger audience. So one Sunday morning, we went to the Metropolitan Museum to count naked bodies in the artworks and we discovered a lot more. In the 19th and 20th century sections of the museum, that era when sex replaces religion as the major preoccupation of European artists, we found this shocking statistic, which made us ask the question, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of the women, of the artists are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. So many years later, we like to think that our work has maybe changed the way curators think about art. So we went back to the Met a couple of years ago to do another count to see if anything was different. This is what we found. Fewer women artists, but more naked males. Do we have to accept this as progress? 
By the mid 1990s, the buzzword in the art world had become multiculturalism and art institutions everywhere were playing catch up, showing one or two artists from each marginalized group that they had previously excluded. But what we noticed is that instead of showing the huge diversity of art made by these groups, the museums showed the same small handful of artists over and over again. So we decided to do a campaign about tokenism. That practice of exhibiting one woman, one artist of color, one gay or trans artist, and considering the problem of diversity solved. We wanted to ask a larger question. Is tokenism a solution or a continuation of the problem of exclusion? Every one of these things happened to members of our group and everyone has her favorite. Mine is at parties and openings, everybody ends up telling me their interracial gay or transgender sexual fantasies. Over the last decade, the Gorilla Girls have been busier than ever, but we've been faced with a huge dilemma. What do you do when the system that you've spent your whole life attacking suddenly embraces you? In 2005, we were asked to do a large scale installation at the Venice Biennale. We agonized over the invitation but in order to get our message out to as large an audience as possible, we decided to participate, but with the understanding that we could criticize the Biennale right on its own walls. And that was a thrill. We did this series of 17 foot high banners that were the very first thing that people saw when they entered the show in the Arsenale. First, <clears throat> we took on the Biennale itself documenting 110 years of discrimination. But we also wanted to declare it the first feminist Biennale. Why? Because for the first time in the history of the Biennale, the women who organized the show, the, the people who organized the show, the curators were women. First time ever in the history of the Biennale. And surprise, there was the highest number of women artists ever in the exhibition. Then we took on the museums of Venice because they all did have work by women in their collections, but where was it kept? In the basements. We made fun of them with this poster based on the iconic Fellini film, La Dolce Vita, asking the question, where are the women artists of Venice? Underneath the men. And then in the bottom in the fine print, we, we told viewers to the Viennale, to go to the museums and demand to see more women on top. In 2008, the Washington Post gave us a full page as part of a special section on feminism and art. We designed this tabloid to reveal the shocking truth about the low, low number of women and artists of color on exhibit in the US National Art Museums on the, in the mall in Washington. And it was to include the fact that at that time, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC didn't have one artwork on display by an African-American artist. So when the Washington Post <clears throat> called to fact check, the National Gallery went bananas. They called back the next day to say, oh, you know, you are mistaken because just last night, we installed a Martin Currier sculpture tokenism at its finest. By the way, here's how bad things were at our taxpayer supported museums. The National Gallery of Art at that time, 98% male, 99.9% .9 white because of one sculpture. You know, a lot of museums have the names of dead <clears throat> white males inscribed on their facades. And we've always wondered, maybe that's part of the bigger problem. Our solution, replacing names like Leonardo, Michelangelo, with artists like Artemisia Gentileschi, Rosa Bonheur, Alma Thomas, Frida Kahlo, and Claude Cahoon. Speaking of Claude Cahoon, we wrote about 
Claude in our bedside companion to the history of Western art. Claude Cahoon lived in France in the mid 20th century and made self portraits in all manner of gender roles. Lucy was born, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Claude was born Lucy Schwab. Claude's life partner and step sibling, Suzanne Malherbe, also renamed himself Marcel. Some books on surrealism list Claude as a man, others as a woman. The Rilla girls think art history needs some new vocabulary to describe artists like Claude Cahoon. You know, we love art and artists, don't get the wrong idea. But let's face it, the art world has some pretty dark corners. There are collectors, curators, and donors and artists who advocate for a fair and diverse art world, but at the same time, there are lots of money launderers, smugglers, tax dodgers, inside traders, museum board members with shady business associates, and a few criminals. In fact, the art world is unregulated. In fact, it's described as the fourth largest black market in the world. And that's after drugs, guns, and diamonds. No wonder there's so much nefarious stuff going on. US museum boards are not filled with art experts, but with super rich trustees, many of whom are also art collectors. And they get huge tax write-offs for their donations as well as info, inside information about which artworks are likely to, to increase in value, helping them out as art investors. Looking closer, <clears throat> lots of these trustees make their money in not so nice industries like fossil fuels, for-profit prisons, making addictive opioid drugs, manufacturing weapons of state control like tear gas and rubber bullets, and even securitizing your ever mushrooming student loans. Collecting art and giving money to museums art washes some of the questionable ways they make their wealth. But we'll talk more about that later. First, let's take a short art quiz. What does art by famous female artists cost compared to art by famous males? Anyone want to guess the percentage? A shocking 14%. The highest auction sale ever for a living female artist, $12.4 million for a Jenny Seville painting, which was actually of a nude female was only 14% of the record price of 90.3 million paid for a David Hockney. Can you make money from a museum while you're on its board of directors? $11 million says yes, because that's what Count Giuseppe Panza was paid for selling part of his art collection to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles while he was on the board. He also sold other work from his collection to the Guggenheim Museum that very year for $30 million. What's one of the major economic forces behind the new Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi? Debt bondage. Foreign workers in the luxury zone, which includes the Guggenheim, are hired from South Asia and flown to the Emirates. When they arrive, their passports are confiscated and their pay is nothing like what they were promised. And they're forced to live under inhumane conditions like you can see in this photograph. This is an easy one. What's more important to the Metropolitan Museum than free speech? Money. The Met accepted $65 million from the ultra right wing Koch brothers, billionaire oligarchs who spent even more than that trying to undermine US elections. What did the Met do after getting their money? Well, they held a big party, then called in the cops to arrest a group of artists who projected this image 
onto the facade of the museum during the party. And they tagged the Cokes as climate change deniers, which in fact they were. While we're speaking of billionaires, here's a sticker campaign we did in New York in 2015. We went after art collectors, galleries, and museums for their complicity in income inequality. <clears throat> here's a picture of it taken right in front of the Museum of Modern Art. Then we turned it into an uninvited projection on the facade of the Whitney Museum in New York with the help of the Illuminator Collective, and they made this video about it. So the world of artists is great, but the art world sucks. The super rich are controlling the museums sitting on the boards. Power is being centralized into these few rich people. Like it's really about the 1%. Unfortunately, the art world right now appears to be about money and about the production of luxury items. Billionaires are making more and more and more, and their taste controls which artists get the big bucks and get the opportunities and get the shows. We're planning to sneak around New York with the Illuminator. So we'll be starting out in Chelsea and we hope to then go to the Whitney. So we had this idea to do something we could do really fast around New York and put these stickers up. Some of the stickers are about art galleries, about billionaires, billionaire collectors, and about museums. So we wanted to put them up where they belong, on the big galleries, on the museums, and give them out to people, especially so they could do the same thing. And it seemed like a great idea. Call people together, just put the word out, see who comes, and just run around the streets and put these things up and bother people. It's gonna be a Saturday in Chelsea. People walking around, feeling really good about having seen all this inspiring art. And all of a sudden, they're gonna see the wall above start talking to them. And it's gonna say, dear art collector. We completely get. Collecting art is so expensive. We really understand why you can't afford to pay all your employees a living wage. The wall is going to talk to them. Every time we put something up, you know, people would throw bananas. Some people would love it, some people would hate it. So we would sort of work in that space. It's really very productive to provoke people to think about things. And we discovered early on that if you could make someone who disagreed with you laugh, then you, know, you had a hook inside their brain. You know, once you were in there, you just might be able to change their minds about things. You know, we believe that museums could use some new ideas. <clears throat> and in 2016, we created the first ever Gorilla Girls Complaints Department at the Tate Modern Museum in London. And over a week's time, thousands of people came to complain about art, gender issues, racism, politics, and the museum itself. Our complaints department traveled to Brazil in Portuguese the following year. And here's where we really, really want to install it. Now, speaking of the power of collective complaining, in the past few years have witnessed protests that have forced museums to make some ethical decisions. Here are some examples of protests we've participated in, but have been organized by other artist collectives. The Guggenheim agreed to refuse money from the Sackler family that manufactures and pushes opioids. Warren Canders, who manufactured the tear gas used on refugee children and families at the Mexican border, was forced to resign from the board of the Whitney Museum. 
There were demonstrations at MoMA to divest itself of prison staff and also to expel board member Larry Fink, whose hedge fund is heavily invested in student debt derivatives and <clears throat> for-profit prisons. He hasn't resigned yet, but lots of activists, including ourselves, are still working on it. We look at it this way. If the wealthiest country in the world is stuck with a system where the only way to fund culture is through philanthropy from the very rich, then maybe institutions should only accept funding from individuals whose businesses make the world a better, not a worse place. In terms of changing museum culture, this past spring, museum employees have started an Instagram account to tell their anonymous stories of racism, sexism, and harassment in their workplaces. And all of these developments convinced us last year to revisit this 1989 poster we did where we proposed that uh, museums have a code of ethics. We updated it and turned it into another monument that could travel around to museums everywhere. <clears throat> we like to imagine it as living in different museums and here it is living in the sculpture garden at MoMA. And this was done for a magazine spread. We used the publication to call out the fact that museums, many museums, whoa, um, <laughs> sorry, that many museums have actually used the pandemic to break unions, unions that demanded living wages and decent benefits for their staff. At the same time, the museum directors made million dollar salaries. Here it is living on the Coke Plaza at the Met. And as you might notice, we wrote the code in biblical language. So allow me to read the last commandment. Thou shalt admit that if thy museum does not show art or hire staff as diverse as the culture thou claimeth to represent, thou art not showing the history of art, thou art merely telling the story of wealth and power. But let's step away from the art world for just a minute <clears throat> because we've done other works about other areas of culture too. Let's take a look at an industry that can be just as bad and that of course is Hollywood. Now um, <clears throat> even though the film industry wants to think of itself as edgy and progressive, if you look closely there's just not enough diversity. So for several years, we rented billboards in Hollywood, just a few blocks from where the Academy Awards were held, and they were up during the ceremony. In 2002, we put this one up, and we decided to put a little bit of realism into the award ceremony. So we redesigned the Golden Boy to look more like the people who took him home. And that was actually the very year that both Denzel Washington and Halle Berry won Oscars for their performances. We kind of like to joke that maybe it was due just a little bit, you know, to our billboards. Here's an update of the same uh, billboard that we did in Minneapolis in 2016 at the height of the Oscars So White campaign. <clears throat> and last year, we updated a 1999 sticker that compared Hollywood to the Senate to realize that in 2019, the Senate had improved a little bit, that that Hollywood had actually gotten worse. And here's something else we did about another pressing social issue. <clears throat> it's a street poster that we did in Montreal about misogyny and violence against women that appeared on the 20th anniversary of the worst mass murder ever in Canada when a gunman claiming that he was fighting feminism killed 14 women studying engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. Our poster is a pretend wall of graffiti, uh, a pretend graffiti wall of sexist hate speech throughout the centuries. 
And it includes quotes from Confucius who said one women, I'm sorry, 100 women are not worth a single testicle to Pat Robertson, the evangelist preacher who said feminism is a socialist anti-family movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, destroy capitalism and become lesbians. It struck us that it's still okay to say things about women and trans women that wouldn't be tolerated if said about other groups. And a case in point is of course, Donald Trump who brags about grabbing women by the genitals and calls women low IQ dogs. He's particularly cruel and racist towards women of color. That brings us to <clears throat> some of our latest projects. You know, close to half of all women and many men and trans people have been sexually harassed and or abused on the streets and in the workplace. And it happens in the art world too. We realize that museums need some help talking about artists who are also sexual predators. So to set the stage, here is the official portrait of President Bill Clinton at the National Gallery, Portrait Gallery in DC. It was painted by an artist who like Clinton has been accused of sexual abuse. What should the National Portrait Gallery say about this interesting coincidence? Well, we're offering them a couple of ways out three ways to write a museum wall label when this, the artist is a sexual predator. Number one, don't mention it at all. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Option number two, mention it a little bit. Chuck Close is one of the most important artists of his generation and the creator of a new kind of portraiture consisting of patterns of color. Like many artists, he's had a few disgruntled models and employees. Number three, be straight up honest. Chuck Close has had a huge career with prices to match. He's been accused of sexually abusing models and students he picked up at fancy art schools. How fitting and ironic that he painted the official portrait of Bill Clinton. The art world tolerates abuse because it believes art is above it all and the rules don't apply to genius white male artists. Wrong. This project has called, caused all hell to break loose and it's been politely turned down again and again and again. Last fall, we put this poster up on a phone booth right outside the newly renovated Museum of Modern Art when it had the nerve to reopen after an elaborate renovation with two new galleries named for donors with close and unexplained ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein, by the way, used the art world for years to art wash his criminal behavior trafficking underage girls. He even picked up some of his young victims at art schools. This brings us to our very last project called The Male Greys, which will premiere in London as soon as it's safe to travel. We are so excited about this project. We've done a very short kind of trailer video and I'd love to play it for you tonight. Here it is. What do art historians call the macho, hetero, predominantly white male perspective in European and American art that depicts women as sexual objects for the pleasure of male viewers? The male gaze. But the gorilla girls call it the male grays. There are lots of naked women in post-colonial Western art. Sleeping in the backyard. Splayed out on beds lounging around with their friends, bathing, dancing, hooking up, being harassed, abducted, bound, raped, and murdered. When we looked into how some revered male artists used and abused women in their real lives, we saw more than gazing, we saw grazing. 
So the question we want to ask is, does life imitate art or art imitate life? Gauguin abandoned his wife and five children to become primitive in the Caribbean and South Pacific. He married a succession of teenage girls as young as 13. He died of syphilis at 55 and probably gave it to many of them. European colonialism at its finest. Of the women who had long-term relationships with Picasso, two died by suicide, two had nervous breakdowns, and one escaped and wrote about it. In 1950, sculptor Dorothy Daner decided her husband, sculptor David Smith, had hit her once too often. She loaded her pickup truck and took off for New York to start a career of her own. Smith turned around and married one of his young students. According to the book Ninth Street Women, Hans Hoffman's summer school in Provincetown was a harem. And Hoffman, the bull elephant who patted his female students on the ass and fucked everything that moved. Lucien Freud admitted to having 14 children by 12 different women. He may have fathered twice as many. He said women go downhill at the age of 16. Sir Lawrence Gowling, principal of the slave school, pimped for Freud, admitting young girls to the art school who had caught Freud's eye. Chuck Close invited his female students from Yale to his studio to sit for portraits. The ones who refused to undress were given $100 and told to leave. The ones who stayed endured prying questions about their sex lives while posing naked. Get ready for the male graze. The Gorilla Girls take on our culture's enduring love affair with bad male behavior and art. We're preparing a new project for the courtyard of Somerset House for Art Night 2021. We hope to see you there. It just might change the way you think about art forever. What do art historians- sorry. Let's close the evening on a positive note. I've hit you with a lot of bad news. Um, the School of the Art Institute in Chicago invited us to deliver the commencement address to the class of 2010 in front of thousands of cheering students in Millennium Park here in Chicago, and also some angry parents. We gave the graduates some surprising and unexpected advice. Afterwards, we turned our manifesto into this video, and here it is. The Gorilla Girls Guide to Behaving Badly, which you have to do most of the time in the world as we know it. Be a loser. The world of art doesn't have to be an Olympics where a few win and everyone else is forgotten. The art market and its hyper-competitive celebrity culture makes everyone but the stars feel like failures. But there's another world out there that's not about raging egos, a world of artistic cooperation and collaboration. That's the one we joined and we invite you to join it too. Let's make trouble together. Be crazy. Political art or Activism that points to something and says, this is bad. It's just preaching to the converted. Instead, try to change people's minds and do it in some unforgettable way. A trick we learn is humor it helps you fly under the radar. If you can get people who disagree with you to laugh at an issue, you have a hook right into their brain. Once there, you have a much better chance to convert them. Be anonymous. Sometimes you gotta speak out publicly, but sometimes it works even better to speak out anonymously. Now, this has its disadvantages, like working your whole life without getting any credit, but it has lots of advantages too. Our anonymity, for example, keeps the focus on the issues and away from our personalities. The mystery of who we might be draws lots of attention to the issues we promote. Plus, you won't believe what comes out of your mouth while wearing a gorilla mask. Be an outsider. Even if you're working inside a system, we say act like an outsider. Seek out the understory, the subtext, the overlooked, and the downright unfair. Then expose it. Jam your culture remake your institution. Just do one thing. If it works, do another. If it doesn't, do another anyway. Don't be paralyzed if you don't get it right every time. Just keep chipping away. We promise that bit by bit, your efforts will add up to something effective. Artists, don't make only expensive art that billionaire art collectors can afford. Curators, don't exhibit only the expensive art your trustees donate. Let's have more cheap art that everyone can own, like books, zines, music, and movies, like our posters. Show museums tough love. It's 
it's unethical that wealthy art collectors who invest lots of money in art can become museum trustees overseeing institutions that in turn validate their investments. It's a lousy way to write and preserve our history. Demand ethical standards inside museums. No more conflicts of interest or insider trading. No more cookie cutter collections of art that cost the most. Convince art collectors their collections are inferior with only work by white male artists. Don't let museums perpetuate the version of art and power with a few tokens thrown in. Make sure your favorite museum casts a wider net and collects the whole story of our culture. Whether you work in a museum or a classroom, don't teach an art history constructed by corrupt institutions. Do like we did. Write your own. Complain, complain, complain. Be a creative complainer. Be a professional complainer. Don't assume people know what's missing from museums. Remind them how many modern and contemporary art collections still contain less than 15% females and artists of color. Use the F word, feminism. We think it's crazy that so many people who believe in the tenets of feminism are still afraid to call themselves feminists. Feminism doesn't get the respect it deserves. Women's rights, civil rights, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, and Black Lives Matter are the great human rights movements of our times. Feminists like us who believe in intersectionality fight for all human rights. No one is free until everyone is free. Feminism is changing the world. It's revolutionizing human thought. Given many people lives, their great grandparents could never have imagined, but there's still so much work to do. There are so many countries worldwide where LGBTQ people and women have little or no human rights. 90% of transgender employees have faced discrimination or harassment at work. In the U.S., no federal law protects them, even though nearly 80% of voters support such a law. Then there's rampant sexism in the tech industry, including the harassment of female gamers. And what about the gender earning gap that the U.S. Congress refuses to move against? Violence and abuse against women, gay and trans Transgender people is still a huge international problem, from gang rape in India to kidnappings in Nigeria to sexual slavery by ISIS to the negligible punishment given out for domestic violence in America. Trans women are assaulted and even murdered in the U.S. But despite all this bad news, feminist resistance movements are exploding all over the world. Let's make the F word feminism the F word for the future. Let's all join together with feminists on the right side of history. Okay, thank you. It's so strange to be doing this without a live audience. I haven't been able to read any of your um, responses to the work, but anyway. Now it's your turn to ask questions, to complain, to rant, whatever you like. But before we get on to that, I'd like to announce something that we're so happy about. This week, our latest book came out, Gorilla Girls, The Art of Behaving Badly. It's a picture book without any art speak, and it includes almost everything that you've seen tonight and even more. So please check it out on our website, www.gorillagirls.com. Okay, thank you so much. Now I'm going to give it over to Clover, who's also in the jungle with me. Okay, thank you so much, Frida. That was amazing. Um, and we do have some questions coming in um, and some comments. Uh, I want to say that the first comment is, how do I join? I'm sold, um, which is a pretty good one. Um, so I'll start with, um, what have been the low points in your decades long kick-ass activism and how have you overcome them? Oh boy, um, I mean, I think there's not enough time you know, for that. But, uh, you know, we just kept chipping away. That was why it's so important that last uh, bit of our manifesto that try one thing if it works, try another if it doesn't work, try another anyway, just keep chipping away. There have been lots of up, up and downs. And I have to say, this summer um, in the last four years has been really difficult trying to, I mean, as, as everyone feels, it's just 
hard to know what to do and how to carry on and how to be vigilant. Um, but we just keep you know, our heads down um, and we realize that these problems are not going to be solved uh, you know, in a day or a week or a month. But we can't give up asking for a better world. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, when you allow an institution to show your work, do you set any conditions? Well, the condition is we can do whatever we want. <laughs> if not, we're out of there. Um, you know, we really don't, you know, our fidelity is to our audience, not to the art power structure. And I think we're only included in the power structure because you know, thousands of people uh, can relate to what we're doing. So, um, you know, it's very, it's not difficult for us to walk away from a, a museum opportunity if we feel in some way um, compromised by it. Um, and also we, we wear gorilla masks, so no one really knows, <laughs> you know, no, no one really knows who we are. And does, is that something that comes up um, often when, that you've walked away or had to, or been faced with the choice to compromise or not? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, um, you know, we were going to publish a book with Feynman Press, which is a very fancy, um, you know, art publisher, probably the most prestigious in the world. And it just happens to be owned by Leon Black, who is on the board of the Museum of Modern Art. And when all of the stuff came out last summer, uh, about Jeffrey Epstein and his connections to Jeffrey Epstein, we, we felt that we could not go through with that book. So we backed out of that. And um, we found a even more wonderful, um, well, we found a wonderful publisher uh, to take this place. And we're, we're thrilled with the book as it is. Okay, the next question, um, when constantly engaging with such serious and disheartening issues, how do you take care of yourself, especially in terms of mental health? Well, I have a little dog that is just <laughs> a great deal of joy to me. Um, I do a lot of exercise um, and I drink from time to time. <laughs> so I think we all have to take care of ourselves in whatever way we can. But to be honest, I love doing this work. It's really wonderful. It's almost its own reward. Um, and I wouldn't change it for anything else in the world. Um, you know, a lot of us have spent time doing guerrilla girl work and away from our own private, you know, art. But I, I think we're making a, a new and different kind of art that's not based on individual genius artists who are totally self-obsessed with themselves and their own experiences. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few more. Um, why posters, pamphlets, and stickers? Has the group considered more 3D media, a 3D sculpture of the anatomically correct Oscar, for example? Well, we do everything on the cheap. We started out doing posters because, you know, you could just get them printed and put them up real fast. Stickers are really cheap. Um, and they can be mass produced over and over and over again. Um, we are doing some three-dimensional things, um, but I don't can't imagine that we would have been able to do that early on. But thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll take one more. Um, in the current socio-political climate, have you noticed a change in the Guerrilla Girls viewership? Um, well, we've always had a lot of support from young people and from students. Um, I think educational institutions have always been a prime support. Um, and if you think about it, we really produce knowledge as much as we produce objects. And I'm kind of proud of that. You know, uh, our portfolios, um, which are now held in a number of 50 museums around the world, uh, they're all the same. But we think of them as a little chunk of art history. Someone studying the history of uh, contemporary art and the structure of the contemporary art world from 1985 on um, would find a lot of information, you know, in in that work. So. Um, I think I've strayed from the answer from that question. 
so so maybe I'll squeeze in one more question. Oh, I'm I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um, how do you balance promoting your personal art with combating the art world as we know it? You know, each one of us has their own solution. Um, you know, we, we all do it in our own ways, but we have the understanding that it's separate uh, and that our individual artwork is one thing and our collective work is another. All right. Well, Frida, thank you so much. Gorilla Girls, thank you so much. And um, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us via this strange new platform that we are on. So um, uh, I hope you'll watch our the Stand Your Gallery website for more virtual um, artist talks coming up. And um, again, Frida, we can't thank you enough. Thank you for all your patience. This is the first time we've done it and I'm sorry for all those tiny little glitches. <laughs> it won't even happen. Anyway, and thanks to Alicia, who is the, the, the brain behind all of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's all working well. And um, Clover, we're both in the same jungle. Shall we both retreat for... Um, we're both gonna retreat to the jungle for a, a, a banana snack. Well, what about a banana daiquiri? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Have a lovely evening, anyone. Everyone will we'll end there. <laughs>